Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hello. Hello. I'm Julia Borston. I'm a reporter with CNBC. And with us today is Pete Cashmore, CEO of Mashable. We will be opening up to Q&A. Um, so tweet your questions, hashtag ask Pete. His Twitter handle is at Pete Cashmore. I am at Jay Borston. Pete, thanks for talking to us today. Thanks for having me. So um, is Mashable a tech company or a media company? Uh, well, I think you have to be both these days, right? There's, Mashable started out as a technology blog. I started in my bedroom when I was 19 in Scotland. And, you know, I saw this wave of technology coming through everything. So we added business. We added entertainment. Um, we looked at how technology was changing those industries. And I think there's no excuse for a media company to not understand technology, to embrace technology, and to understand that this is the new distribution channel, it's the new way to engage with your readership, it's inspiration for creating content. Um, you know, it's all those things, and I think not only do media companies all have to be technology companies in a big way, but every other industry, you know, finance, uh, healthcare, like all those companies need to be tech companies, really. So everyone has to be a tech company, every media company has to be a tech company, but you are making a particular move into technology with Velocity. Mm -hmm. Explain what Velocity is and why it makes sense for Mashable sort of to invest in this tech business. Yes, yeah, so um, one of the things Mashable does is like, so the way this Velocity technology came around was, you know, our audience wants to know what's new, what's next in everything. And when we redesigned our site in 2011, we had to figure out, you know, people didn't want to know, like, what's the hot story after it's become the biggest thing on the web? They don't want to be, like, the last person to say, like, have you seen this Gangnam Style video? It's cray, you know? <laughs> like, you want to be the first one. So one of the things we did was to look at, well, can we predict if that's going to happen or not? Um, and we kind of honed algorithms and brought in data scientists to figure out not just what's big on the web right now, but what's going to be big in eight hours, what's going to be big tomorrow. And we do things like look at the inflection curve, look at who's sharing, when they're sharing, how quickly it's accelerating. And then we make predictions. So we essentially have uh, a viewport uh, behind Mashable that editors can look at that say, you know, this particular story is here right now, but it's going to have 10,000 shares in eight hours, and it's going to have 20,000 shares in 10 hours, uh, not just on our site, but on everyone's sites across the web. And now we actually, not only do we use that internally, not only do we display it on our site as well, but we uh, also license that directly to advertisers. So Velocity is the predictive algorithm. Yes. And it's like a software that you license out you charge, you have a couple of clients, including Washington Post, I believe? Um, so we have, right now we have MEC is our main client. We piloted it with uh, 360i last year. Um, so really working directly with the ad agencies. Or with the ad agencies, yeah. okay. So it, once you've posted stories, you could tell how well they're gonna do. But can you, does it sort of influence, when from an editorial standpoint, what types of stories you should write? Or do you say, you know, T you know, stories about Apple and iPhones do really well in general, so we should use that information to write more iPhone stories? Yes, yeah, so we're getting there, actually. So initially, the idea was like, we're just going to look across the whole web. We're going to do it on a URL basis of like, um, tell us which stories on which sites are going viral. What we've done since is we've added uh, natural language processing, so we can look at the topics that are going viral, so we can have a topical thing. So we set up, each editor has a different thing, like the entertainment editor has, says, like, here's what's happening in entertainment. Um, but we can also say, like, um, it now does topical, like, this particular word is trending, or this particular person is trending. Um, and we're trying to make it more complex, right? We're trying to figure out, can it tell us, you know, this story should be a little bit more like this, or your readers want something about this. Um, and we're also doing more demographic stuff. So, like, can you tell us what's going to trend with 21-year-old males in America or whatever? So we're doing a lot of that stuff. By the way, there's a crazy echo in here. Echo. Yeah, it is. Go. Oh. I don't know if it's only for us or for everyone And this else. man has to draw everything we do. So make sure you say some <laughs> difficult stuff. <laughs> some visually complex ideas. Um, so yeah, there is a crazy echo. Um, so what is the most surprising thing you've learned from this? Um, what's the most surprising thing we've learned? Well, I mean, I think the, the whole intent of it, right, is to the powerful thing about the web is that you can engage with people, and what Velocity is trying to do is to create a better kind of uh, communication 
channel with our readers, right? Because essentially telling us, here's what your readers really want to see, so that you know in advance. So what we've really learned is that if you can hone that loop, uh, it can be an incredibly successful relationship for both you and the reader. I'm not sure if there's anything that came out of it that's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that thing is super viral. Uh, but maybe we'll learn that as we go along. And when you license it out to the ad agencies, how are they using it? Um, so they use it in all kinds of ways. They use it both. Um, so, so one of the ways they use it is to figure out what they should share on social. So if you're watching like the Super Bowl or the Oscars or whatever, it's going to tell you like this is going to be the moment that's big. You know, you can tell when Ellen takes the selfie or whatever. You watch the data. You say, okay, this is insane. You just get on this. But that kind of thing is a short cycle. It works best with like, you know. Eight hours out, this thing's going to be huge, so you should make a video and put it on YouTube, or you should uh, tweet a reaction. We have um, kind of both um, uh, kind of promotional uses, but also reactive uses of like, uh-oh, we have something bad happening, or a competitor has something bad happening, and we're going to react to that before they know it's happening. So there's all kinds of uh, use cases with regard to knowing like what's going to happen in the future. And so um, tell me about how this technology influences Mashable as an editorial entity and the editorial decisions you're making on the content side every day. Yeah, so I think there's two ways to look at media, right? It can be prescriptive or descriptive. And I think you've got to do both, right? You've got to give people their first course and their dessert. And I think Velocity can tell you, as all data can tell you, what's already happened or is, is happening. It can't craft a whole new story, and it can't go investigate a story for you. So, so we don't have to worry that robots are going to replace all writers. And um, so that's a great narrative, and we'll get to that. I mean, no is the, is the short answer, um, and I'll tell you why. But primarily, Velocity tells us, you know, it basically does the grunt work of going out on. We used to have editors would have TweetDeck and all their computers, and they'd just be tracking all the time. Like they'd be writing an article and just watching if anything was kind of buzzing while they were doing it. Now it can kind of aggregate all that and say, here's the things you really need to watch because these are the ones that are gaining steam. Uh, but that doesn't replace this idea of well, also go out and investigate your own stories and also go and find unique scoops that aren't already happening. You can only react to data. Um, with regard to like the automation of everything, which is kind of the wave rim, right? We're talking about self-driving cars and all these cool technologies, AI. Um, we do use AI to the extent that it learns about what's happening on the web. So it's learning, like this site, uh, stories tend to go viral in this way on this particular site, and they're different. So for instance, for Mashable, we have to course correct, because we tweet our story, then it goes up, then it evens out, then it either goes huge or stays, right? So it learns like the patterns. And it can learn like human language, like this word is associated with this thing. But it, it doesn't write the story for you yet. Um, and I don't think it ever will. I think, I think there are certain areas of writing that have been automated, right? But one of the key things about being successful in the web is being very human. And this is what you learn from all these new apps and technologies is to succeed on the web today, you need to tell stories in a new voice. You need to tell them in a new format. And Voice and culture is something that humans innately get. Like humor, that's really hard to program. So we can't do that. We can't um, explain to a computer like what a cultural moment is, or how we're going to remix it, or react to it, or go find the reactions on the web. So those are the areas, the, the areas of creativity, the areas of uh, human expression, humor. Those things can't be automated. I can't imagine they ever would you want to make it or that we want to, but we really see the machines as helping us do all the kind of stuff we don't want to do. As a journalist, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> um, so looking at what Velocity means for your future, are you trying to build sort of like a next generation Bloomberg? I mean, Bloomberg is a journalism entity, but it also sells these Bloomberg terminals, which make a lot of money because they're basically data, uh, data services. Um, I think it's part of our business, right? We have quite a number of you know, revenue streams, advertising being the biggest one. I think that one has a dual benefit, though, right? Because it's a technology we built for our newsroom that happens to be useful to other people. But we also build technology for our CMS so we can tell stories in a new way. Uh, we also, you know, build our own apps in-house and that kind of thing. So I think you have this technology thread that goes through everything, and you have to figure out which bits do we want to build proprietary, and how do we make it a full circle all the way from you start in velocity, you find the story, you go into the CMS, you post the story, you go to the analytics, you find out what worked, and then you come back and you do it again. Um, 
so we use technology kind of at all points of our business, and some of it we license, some of it we use like the CMS internally. Um, and you know, when we build tools that are useful to us, we see if other people might like to use them too. So down the line, you could be selling other software. Um, that's not something we've really thought about. Um, you know, we're trying it out with Velocity. I think um, I think Velocity is kind of the it's the starting point for what we call the Mashable Marketing Suite, which is advertisers have access to everything, all the way from Velocity to Social Lift, which is our ad product, where you can like run your Instagrams and your Vines and your YouTube videos to our branded content. So we see that as kind of the whole loop, the marketing suite, as you start with Velocity, what other things would you like from us? Could, do you want content being made? You know, because one of the things that Velocity does is creates demand for like, okay, I know that like, uh, penguin sweaters are going viral. I need a video in eight hours. Can you do it? You know, like it, it kind of starts the conversation of, okay, well now I need some content. So you talked about what, um, how voices are different. What is the voice of Mashable and who is the target audience? Yes, so the key thing I think about telling stories, so we have obviously on our staff, our, our main editor is a guy called Jim Roberts who came across from the Times. He was there for like 20 plus years. Um, and we have a lot of these uh, very experienced journalists. And when we bring them on board, we want them to do a couple of things. We want them to tell stories in new formats, uh, you know, for mobile or on our site, and we want them to tell stories in a new voice. And what is unique about our voice is that much of our content is distributed through social networks. So we like to say we want to be your most trusted Facebook friend. We want to be your most credible social connection. You know, there are, there are definitely brands and that are kind of broadcasty. That you'll see a, you'll see a headline on your Facebook feed, and you'll say, you know, I can really trust that. But it doesn't necessarily seem to gel with the fact that you have a baby photo, then you have this story, then you have another personal update from a friend. So we want to fit in that ecosystem, but we also want to be trusted, right? It's also very possible to get your stuff shown in that feed. But when I look at the URL on my Facebook, I say, okay, I'm not really sure I know that site. I'm not sure I can trust it. So we see a kind of a sweet spot between you know, is this a brand that's accessible and approachable for me that speaks in a human voice? And is this a brand that I can trust that has great journalists who are uh, telling well-researched stories? And I think there's a really nice kind of uh, in-between point. They do the, the really, you know, they make sure that all their stories are accurate, but then they tell them in a human way like you would tell a friend. And who's your target audience? How old are they? Yeah, so we primarily, so we call our target audience the digital generation, which is like millennials and people who think like them. So, um, you know, the, the bulk of our audience is in that millennial group. Um, and they tend to be, but, but it's more of an attitude than it is a age group. So it's people who are early adopters. They want to know what's new, what's next in everything, not just technology. They want to know what's next in music, what's next in film, what's next in TV, what's next in uh, politics. And they tend to share a lot. They tend to be really engaged. They don't want to be broadcast to. They want to interact. They want to give us feedback. They want to be part of the process of making the story. So while it is that kind of millennial age group, it's bigger than that because it's also people that um, that want to engage. Jeff's down there meerkatting and trying to hide. <laughs> Bye, meerkat. Bye, meerkat. <laughs> okay, so we got to talk about meerkat. What do you yeah. think about meerkat? Clearly, you love meerkat. Hello, meerkat. Well, I do. I mean, what's a little bit strange about that, right, is that I think what's valuable about these tools, and again, it's about telling stories, right? So what's valuable about these tools is video is getting very popular, but it's a kind of a, being a passive medium. <laughs> Pete Pichal is now meerkatting the meerkat. It's really putting me off. Um, <laughs> video has gotten really popular on mobile devices. It's great to consume, but people want to participate. And you know, I was able to interview one of the founders actually here at South by Southwest, a guy called Ben. And um, you know, one of the things he said is what's really important is the engagement aspect. He said, there is no viewer. Everyone's a broadcaster. And this idea that you can kind of choose your own adventure and you can engage in real time. And I was walking around South by Southwest yesterday and people would tell me, you know, where to go and what to do. And I was at the Mashable house and they made me get this emoji poop tattoo. And we can nice. see that. Um, 
It's that part of it. It's the, it's the idea that you are an engaged consumer. I guess consumer is the wrong word in that sense. But it's not just about the first person perspective, which is really valuable, but it's also about can you interact with it. So, you know, this may not be the best use case because I can't see what people are saying and kind of respond and mm -hmm. interact. But I think there are great use cases when you're just walking around and giving people an experience and saying, where should I go? What should I do? And Twitter just bought Periscope. Is this the new era of live broadcast streaming? Everyone a broadcaster? I think it could be. You know, there's a couple things that are quite valuable about live streaming, OK? Um, one of them is this idea that social media, when it came out, so what always happens is you mirror what already exists on the mobile device. So you had like Instagram, which was kind of flicker on a phone, right? And you get Facebook come across and Twitter come across. Um, then you get this next wave of what's organic to the phone and what can you only do on the phone. Um, but you also have had this trend towards more reality in social media, right? Well, people are a little, um, maybe, maybe getting a little fed up with, in a way, is this idea of perfection on social media. And that kind of evolved from the trend towards filters. And that is certainly a, a, a side of your life. You know, you, you put out a pretty perfect life on, on Facebook or Instagram, but then you had the Snapchat era where it was more about, okay, can it be real and how do we make it more real? If we make it disappear afterwards, are people gonna be a bit more honest in their communication because they're not scared of the consequence of that existing forever? And I think live streaming fits within that arc, right? It's about you can be in the moment, you can interact with people, and you turn it off and it's gone forever. So you're not trying to be perfect. And I think as media companies get on this or as other organizations get on this, they'll probably try and be a bit too perfect with it. And that's really not what it's trying to be. Like, be crappy. You know, that's what, I like, so, like sometimes it's just, it's just me walking around. But I think it, it, people like it because it feels very human. They feel like they're there, they feel like they're with you. Anything might happen at any time, it's the unexpected. I also think what's interesting about Meerkat though is, or all those live streaming tools is that there's really nothing new, it's just a new thing enabled by the phone, right? So the big problem, we used to do live streaming on Mashable, you know, like five years ago, we'd have these mass chats. We did the same thing actually, interacted with Twitter, right? And it would send all the comments back to Twitter and you'd get you know, tens of thousands of people and it would bring down our site. The challenge with live is getting people to one place at one time is really hard. Um, and when everyone was on their desktops, it was even harder. Now everyone has a phone in their pocket. They get a notification. You can get people to come to one place very quickly. It was also hard to get the technology to be reliable, and everyone didn't have a camera in their pocket. Um, and I also think there's something that Meerkat's done in the sense that it's just super simple. It's reduced. It's not like this was their first app. They had Evo. It was a more fully built thing. It was trying to recreate everything you could do on desktop live streaming. And this is really, it's almost like what I would call a half app, right? It kind of like, it uses Twitter for its distribution, and then it, it just lets you do really reliable live streaming, and it does all this smart stuff. Like if I get a phone call halfway through the stream, I can hang it up, or I can take it for 30 seconds, and I can come back, and it's still streaming. So I think they did a lot of smart stuff, but primarily they made it really smart, and they made it native to the mobile phone. And is it going to change the way Mashable does its business? I mean, it's, I mean, it's only really been around for a brief period of time, but are you guys going to start live streaming everything? Or is, I mean, I know you just raised a big fund around a financing uh, earlier this year, and part of that was to invest in video. Mm -hmm. This is a different kind of video. Yes, yeah, so it's early. Um, so a couple of things on that. Obviously, you know, we're investing in velocity, we're investing in video in a big way in all kinds of formats, all the way from editorial news video to a branded video team who make kind of uh, fun, shareable videos uh, for brands. Um, we also have a team, and Jeff runs it, um, called the Mashable Collective, which is they make stuff for other networks. And this is kind of a big trend in social now. So the collective makes Vines and Snapchats and Instagrams, uh, not just for us, but on behalf of brands as well. And by networks, you mean platforms, all these other platforms. Yeah, app things. App things. I don't know what we call them now. But um, yeah, so across, you know, maybe Meerkat becomes one of those where we say, how do we tell stories in this new medium? What are the things that resonate and what are the things that don't? And we're having a fun time right now figuring out how does this work? What are the new rules? You know, one of the things I found with it is 
Um, because new people join the stream, you have to kind of remind them as you go along. It's kind of like when you get back from an app break, it's like, okay, we're here at South by Southwest, yeah. yeah. we're in Austin, Texas. Because people come in and they're like, hey, where are you guys? Um, so you have to remember that there's new people joining all the time mm -hmm. and you have to kind of explain yourself. Um, but yeah, so we think distributed uh, content creation is something that's going to become important and has been important to us. And we've, you know, for years now done things like uh, create vines on behalf of brands or do contests on our vine or get our community to kind of submit uh, vines and then a brand will uh, award a winner and we'll run it through our site and all the ad units and that kind of thing. So we do a lot of content creation on networks that aren't our own platforms. Including Snapchat, you mentioned. Including Snapchat. Um, yes. What do you think about Snapchat as a content distribution platform? Uh, I think it's going to be really big. I really like Discover. I think it's a fun way to tell stories. Again, it's a mobile native way to tell stories. We do a lot of Snapchat stories, all the way from like what's happening in the office to what's happening in the news. Um, but you have to do that in a more human voice. So, uh, you know, we doodle on the Snapchats and we write on them and we, you know, we try and make it fun and engaging and human. And I think that's the important thing about these. It's not about broadcast. It's not about being passive. It's about telling stories in the way that is native to the app. And what about Facebook? Facebook's been making a huge push into video. How have you been using that? Yeah, that's been huge for us as well. Um, and again, there's slightly different rules for Facebook, right? So um, in some, you know, you have the audio off, so you have to consider that idea. It tends to be kind of favor the shorter form stuff. Mm -hmm. It's also playing in your feed, so you need something that's engaging. Um, I think all these platforms are going to live side by side, but there's going to be different ways to tell stories on them, and you can't necessarily create once and then just throw it on every platform and expect it to resonate. And how do you make sure you're not too reliant on one platform? as opposed to another. I mean, there are all, the, all these conversations I'm hearing among publishers and advertisers about, oh, you start optimizing for Facebook, and then Facebook changes its algorithm. How do you deal with that? Yeah, so that's something we think about a lot. Um, so Mashable's been around for almost 10 years. And in the first wave, I remember, it was all about Google. Google was the most important thing. And people would really over-optimize. And you had a number of companies who had close to 100% of their traffic coming from Google. They'd optimize for keywords. There were all these gurus who could tell you, like, well, you have to put the word at the start of the headline, and then you have to have this many words. And if you add this keyword, it's going to show up. And you put it in a system, be kind of like running AdWords, and you say, well, this word's competitive with these words, so use this one. Um, what happened to those companies is the content wasn't very good for humans, which comes back to that idea of if you over-automate stuff, humans can tell. Um, so you ended up with a lot of very bland articles that you know, you click through and it wasn't really what you wanted. You know, you'd search for cars and it would come up with some page about cars and you click through and it wouldn't really be that interesting. So what Google did is they observed that behavior. They said, hey, why are all these people clicking this link and then within 10 seconds closing the tab and going back to Google? And they started to downrank all those sites because they weren't offering quality content for the readers. And I think in the social wave, you don't want to be optimizing for the technology. You don't want to be saying, OK, what's going to work with Facebook's algorithm today? What is, what, how are we going to maximize our edge rank in the way we did with our page rank? What you want to do is make stories that are really engaging for people, and then you're fine. You know, Facebook's always going to optimize for what do the users want to read? Are they staying on that page for a long time? That's getting more and more important. If you're coming to a page and clicking away, it probably means that it wasn't very good. Um, and at Mashable, we try to keep each source of traffic around 20% or below. So you have, uh, you have your social networks, each of them trying to keep them around 20. You have Google. You have direct traffic at that proportion. Um, so you have own platforms, which is stuff like apps and the main site. And that's your hardcore users who come to Mashable every day. And then you have your distributed networks, where you try and keep them kind of at a level where basically, if they went away completely, you'd be fine. But so you're intentionally trying to make sure you're not too reliant on one of the social platforms. Yeah, and I'm not going to, you know, if we suddenly get stuff going super viral in the network, I'm not going to be like, cut it off. No yeah. more traffic <laughs> from there this month. But. Um, we try not to, we try and be very distributed. You know, we'll yeah. say like, okay, we're gonna put one person on Pinterest and they're gonna be the Pinterest person and one person on Snapchat and they're gonna work on that platform. Because again, you need to tell stories in new ways for each platform. 
and you need to learn the rules of the road for each platform. Um, but, but we don't overly rely on any singular source of traffic. Tell me about uh, native content. We've been yeah. alluding to it a little bit. You create content for brands. What's your vision? I mean, how important is native content to Mashable? Um, so it's, it's a fast growing piece of our business, but we do a couple things. So one of the things is we do um, branded content series, which can be thematic, which is like, you know, you're a company that wants to talk about innovation, so we'll write a series on innovation, and you'll, um, you know, you'll have your name up top or around in display, or um, be, you know, in some cases integrated in some way that's disclosed. We also, and increasingly we do that in video, right? Mm -hmm. So you might have, um, you know, Eve Behar, the designer, driving around the Cadillac telling you about great design. And the sponsorship is there, it's obvious, but if the content is integrated, uh, if the content is inspiring or in informational or entertaining, then it works great. I see it as like the comedians in cars getting coffee model, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you know it's sponsored by Acura, but the integrations are so cool when Jerry just kind of runs across an Acura randomly and goes like, oh yeah, this is sponsored by Acura, let's tell the people that, and then he walks off. You know, it's like, you can do, you can do cool product integrations. Um, and, and so that's how video works. And then we have Social Lift, which is uh, basically if, if um, our advertisers have Vines or tweets or Instagrams or any social content they would like to get more eyeballs on, then they run them in units around our site, both on the homepage and sidebars, uh, all over the place. And we can also create content for that. So if the Mashable Collective makes you some Vines or some Instagrams or something like that, we can run those in units around the site. And then the third way we use those is to promote the branded content. You know, if we've written an article series or made a video or something like that, we'll put it into the little uh, social lift units. But the key rule for that is it has to be as good or better than the content we'd make on the site anyway. So it has to be super shareable. And that's kind of the, the golden rule for if people are gonna like it, it can't be lame. When we first started talking about native content maybe five years ago, I remember there were all these concerns that, oh, there's going to be backlash, people aren't going to want to read it. But have we moved past those concerns? Are we just over concerns about native content? Is it just the, the new way of the world? I think we should always be concerned about trust, because that's all that uh, media companies have. That is what they trade in. Again, being your most trusted Facebook friend is about knowing that when a story comes from Mashable, uh, that you can believe it and you can share it and know that your friends aren't going to be like, well, that's not true. Um, so I think there should always be a high bar for what you put on your site or what you create, and everything must have a very high standard. Uh, so I think it's a worthy conversation to have. I think as we move into the video era, in a way, disclosure becomes easier, right? Because you can say right up front, this video is brought to you by X, and you know. Um, you think people are used to that in video? Yeah, it's almost more, you know, we've had this decades of television with product placement and all that kind of stuff, which is kind of more subtle than the stuff that's being done on the web, frankly. I mean, we say up front, this is brought to you by Cadillac, you yeah. know? And people don't mind if it's great content. You raise this fund raising round in January, you're investing more in video. What does the future of Mashable look like, you know, now that you have all this new cash to invest? So, I think there's a couple, I think the first wave, you know, 2005 through kind of now was uh, the print and newspaper wave. You had all these dollars come across from print as people started finding new, new sites to consume their content on. What we're in now is like a TV wave, right? So you're having more and more video coming online. You're getting advertisers demanding video. You're getting readers wanting to watch more video on their phones. Uh, that is the era we're in now. And I see Mashable becoming, if previously it was uh, just analogous to kind of a newspaper online, you're now talking about uh, being very video centric, more like television, more produced. Um, but that brings with it a few words that, that maybe don't reflect the new medium, because obviously it's going to be more engaging, it's going to be more fun, it's going to have all the way from short form to medium to long form video. Um, but what we try and do as we produce more video is maintain our voice, right? Because it's way more obvious when you do video who you are. Um, and when we do that, we want to inform, inspire, entertain. We want to have fun video. We want to have inspirational video. We want to have video that you're going to share because 
Um, it's doing a social good in the world. Um, so for us, the key thing about video is how do we maintain voice as we go into that? And um, how much more of the content on your site is going to be video as opposed to print? I mean, it's going to be a huge push in that direction. Yeah, I mean, we haven't really specific percentages. I think you could probably safely say in like three to five years, most media companies are going to be producing um, maybe even the majority of their content in video. I think it's going to be a huge trend because it is so easy to consume on mobile devices, uh, and it's just it's just a medium that travels. You know, if you talk about what we do with the the collective, it's about creating content that yes, it starts on our site, but it ends up on Instagram. It can end up on Snapchat. It can end up on YouTube. It can end up on Facebook video now, and Twitter has video now. So. It's a medium that travels, and that is leading to the web being more distributed. So when we look at video, we don't only look at our own platforms, but we also look at, OK, what can we produce uh, that can go on all the other networks? Who's your main competition? So that's quite distributed as well. So when you think about the wave that happened, you know, we originally, if you looked at where the ad dollars were, they were in newspapers and magazines, and they moved to web. So that was our competitive set then. Now, the dollars are moving from television, video production, over to web companies. But in the broader spectrum, we compete with different people on different networks. So on Facebook, we compete with your friend's baby photos. And we compete with any other media company that's distributing through Facebook. And then on Twitter, we, do, we compete with news organizations all the way from you know, the big ones to the new media upstarts. So I think it's fairly distributed. And then on the tech side, obviously, you know, we're licensing software. So there's a whole set. Um, I think the pie is pretty big, though, and it's expanding very quickly. And I think that the amount of consumption is growing much faster than the number of media companies. I actually think there's room for a lot more uh, media companies, and I, I definitely welcome more people to the party because if you look at how people are consuming, they used to only be able to consume media in very small chunks. You know, you turn the TV at six o'clock, you can watch an hour. Now you can be in the line waiting for your groceries or whatever, and you can pull out your phone, you can watch five minutes of video or read a Mashable article and share it. You can be, you know, walking around South by Southwest listening to a podcast. You can be, um, consuming on the subway on the way to work. So there are so many more places where people are consuming that there's going to be, people are saying, oh my goodness, how can there be so many new things? I think there's going to be way more media companies and there's room for them all. And it's all because of mobile. It's all because of mobile, right? It is, is it all because of mobile? Um, yes. Um, I mean, because that's where the growth is coming from. Mobile is part of a spectrum, though. So like, you had these big mainframe computers. Then you had desktops. Then you had laptops. Now you have mobile phones. You're going to have wearables have and all kind of small yeah. stuff. Yeah. So yes, but it's also part of a spectrum. And what's great about mobile and then wearables and all that is it forces you to figure out, how can I tell my story more succinctly? How can I tell it in a way that's native to that medium? And how can I kind of extract the essence of it? Maybe I tell it visually. Maybe I tell it in video. Maybe I find a way to interact with the audience. Um, so it, it is the number of new de connected devices is what's really key. Because those devices might also be the connected home devices. You might be able to speak to your Amazon Echo or whatever and say, what's the news today? And it will give mm. you your report from the news. You know? so, or give us the, the stock price for my, you know, for my investments or whatever. So, it's kind of more than mobile. It's about more and more connected devices. So over the past decade, you've been adapting the, the message that you've been creating, the, the, the content that you've been creating to fit these new mediums. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like mobile, I mean, how do you think of, I mean, you said saying, you know, telling stories more succinctly. Now you have the potential for better video on mobile. How do you think about the future of creating content for consumers who are always on the go? I mean, do you think about the Apple Watch content that you could create? Um, yeah, I mean, it's early on watches. We're going to find out. Again, what's great about new medium is you have to play with it. So I'll definitely get one and see you know, what are my habits and what do I like doing, what do I not. I think one of the things that's going to be really important with wearables, um, because I played around with Google Glass, rest in peace, um, <laughs> for, 
for a, over a while, and one of the things that I noticed was really different about that device as it was on your face was how annoying it was to get a lot of notifications. It didn't work like your mobile device. If you have something on your head that buzzes every time like someone publishes a news story, that's annoying. You need to be more succinct. You need to be more contextual for people. Um, and I think it's going to be the same with if you've got a device on your wrist. It has to be, you have to limit your notifications a little bit. That is something I feel quite strongly about on those devices. Uh, the media company is going to have to figure out how can they be your friend on those and not treat it as yet another place to push you more notifications because I don't want it buzzing every time there's a new article from my favorite news site. I want to set it up so maybe I only get the breaking news or I only get something huge has happened in the world that I have to know right now or I get something personalized or I get something that's contextualized or something like that. So um, I think that will definitely be a very different medium. I don't think we can make any assumptions about it until we use it. Uh, you work very closely with Madison Avenue in a number of different ways. You have advertisers who are just buying traditional ads. You have advertisers who are, you're creating content for, distributing for them. Um, when you think about sort of how Facebook's investing more in video, Twitter, the same, do they think of you know spending money on Mashable as an alternative to Facebook? Do you think Facebook is sort of a competitor, or are you trying to convince them, if you want to get on Facebook, you have to do it through us, or are you sort of a conduit to reaching people on Facebook? Um, so I think the reason to advertise on Mashable is, again, our core audience is early adopters. We were on the first on uh, Twitter. We you know, learned that medium. We figured out what worked, what didn't. We used it to kind of source stories and also as a distribution channel. And we ended up having you know, the most influential people on Twitter following us, sharing our stories, engaging. We've done the same on every other social network. So advertising on Mashable is about how do you reach the most influential people with your ads? How do you, you know, if you're already running a tweet, you can put it on social lift and get it more amplification by putting it in front of the most influential people. You can do the same with an Instagram or with a Vine. Or if you want to go further, you can create content on Mashable. We can do branded articles, thematic series, and that can get shared a lot in those networks. So it goes across all networks, but it's really about how do you, you know, instead of blasting it out there, how do you reach the kind of the core influencers on those networks? You made uh, recently made a deal to expand to India. Yeah. What does it say about your global exp expansion plan? Yeah. So the the other cool thing about this kind of period in media is that it intersects with globalization. So you have around the world uh, these countries that are growing, leapfrogging us essentially in terms of going straight to mobile, not even doing the whole desktop phase, not even uh, having all the other phases in computing, um, billion plus people in India and South America and they have a need for news and there aren't news organizations to serve them yet. So the first thing we did internationally was we expanded to the UK and Australia um, because we had a huge readership there. So uh, we were able to expand to those. We put editorial there, we put ad sales there. Now we're going into India. Uh, our English speaking content can run there. And it's about telling stories that are, uh, you know, coming from that bureau, but it's also about what we get is kind of a triple benefit from these international sites, right? We get Indian content runs on Mashable US, the US content runs on their site, and then we also get the benefit of just having more and more of a 24-hour news organization and having people on the ground, you know? So when stuff happens in Sydney, we have a reporter there. You know, when stuff happens in London, we have a reporter there who can go out and cover it. Um, so we're getting all kinds of benefits that we didn't expect from these international offices. But India in particular is just, Hugely entrepreneurial culture, lots and lots of consumption on mobile phones, and a massive opportunity. It's just a way bigger country than the US. Yeah, it's huge. And what's next after India? Um, so I think we've already spoken about that uh, Southeast Asia is really interesting to us. Um, Asia in general, uh, we are tackling English speaking first. So, um, you know, places like Singapore, where there's a big expat community, are pretty easy for us to go into. We already have readership there. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, we'll see. We'll look to, uh, you know, there are obvious other big markets like the rest of Asia where, where we'll kind of look to. How do you go into those markets? They're a little trickier, so we'll take a bit more time. We are going to open up to questions in a couple minutes. So tweeting your questions now, they're going to pick some out. And 
backstage and, uh, and show them to me so we can figure out what to ask. So start tweet now if you haven't already. Um, a question about Time Warner. Time Warner, big, giant, mm -hmm. old-fashioned media conglomerate is one of your investors. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of traditional media companies buy startups such as yours, digital media companies. Um, doesn't seem like you're in the market to sell having just closed a, a fundraising round, but what do you get out of that relationship mm -hmm. uh, with such a big uh, media company? Yes, yeah, so obviously there's a lot of change in media right now. I think Time Warner Investments is the VC arm, so their, primar their primary incentive is to uh, make money, actually. <laughs> um, and you know, they, they had various investments. One of their recent investments was Maker Studios, which mm -hmm. sold to Disney. I think, you know, they obviously want to be active in media. They want to understand media. Uh, they want to understand how the changes in media affect their business. But they also primarily are a VC firm, so their intent is, what are the fastest growing businesses? How can we get a return for our investors? Um, I couldn't speak specifically to kind of how they uh, think strategically about, okay, what are we learning from this and how can we use this in our business? Well, what about you? What are you learning from them? You have a... The yeah, so we were able to add Rachel Lamb to our board as part of that, um, who did the Time Warner round. Um, and she just brings a wealth of experience from media. She worked with uh, Dick Parsons prior mm -hmm. to Time Warner and has an immense amount of video experience. Um, you know, Time Warner being primarily, uh, you know, maker Video of company, television, yeah. HBO, um, you know, Warner Brothers, all that stuff. Uh, they're able to bring a lot of video expertise, which, you know, there is potential there for us to work with them because, you know, I just love what HBO is putting out. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from their video properties. So five years from now, will you be the next generation media conglomerate a la Time Warner? Um, I don't know if anyone ever wants to be called a conglomerate. Um, <laughs> Media giant. What is your, your big picture vision for Mashable for five years? Um, well, these are all kind of scale words, which kind of imply that media needs crazy big scale, um, which right now it does. I mean, I think we, with every revolution or evolution, you get new companies springing up and becoming one of the dominant forms. So, right, you had cable, you had, you know, CNN sprung up, a bunch of news organizations that were specific to cable, you had sports with ESPN, and it wasn't easy for the existing people to move into that and to dominate there. And I think with new media, it's the same, right? You're gonna end up with a handful of companies that are the, the kind of the new uh, guard as such, and, you know, one of the great things that we do is we remain light in our feet, so as those waves come through, we can kind of stay ahead. So it was computers, now it's mobile phones. Uh, you know, we try and be social, we try and be mobile, we try and, um, you know, do more native advertising, more integrated advertising. Um, so I think we have a huge opportunity at being one of the dominant media companies of this generation. And who do you think the other ones are gonna be? Is it BuzzFeed? Um, well, I think there's going to be a bunch of them. I think whoever is responsive to their readership, who is able to adapt to the technology and the changing means of consumption, and just very malleable. You know, what I try and do at Mashable is not get too structured around, you don't want to be the dinosaurs, right? You don't want to be over-evolved for a certain living condition, and then mobile comes along, or watches come along, uh, new ways of consuming come along, and you can't adapt. So. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to be one of the dominant players. We think there's plenty of room. We don't spend too much time thinking about, you know, looking in the rear view mirror and trying to figure out, you know, what else is going on. Okay, perfect opportunity to go to one of our tweeted in questions. The question is, what's next? What's relevant? How do you distinguish key disruptive trends from minor ripples in our digital world? From Shui Lam. Mm. So nobody knows what the next hit app is going to be. Um, you can make some educated guesses based on what's happened previously, but you can't know. So one of the things I like doing is just experimenting with stuff. You know, if we play with Meerkat, maybe it will be the next big thing. But even if it isn't, we will learn so much from that process of what works in live streaming. What are the effective ways to communicate with people? What's different about this medium? So we like to try stuff. Um, 
Is there anything you've tried that you've been disappointed by or things that you thought were going to be interesting that just didn't actually take off? Um, anything here at South By you've played around with? Anything? So are you, are you asking me, is there anything crappy at South By? No, I mean, but like, is there like last year, was there some version of Meerkat or, you know, whatever the hot start oh, so, was last yeah, year? Yeah. yeah, so that, yeah, totally. Um, so Twitter took off at, at South by Southwest, um, and that one worked. Sometimes stuff is very contextual to South by Southwest, so it doesn't necessarily work. Like, um, you know, there were a few years where it seemed like location-based networking was going to be a thing, and we'd all share a location. That didn't translate. Like so I think color. Remember color? Color. Yeah, the photo thing. Yeah, it was like a location. Um, out. Yeah, so basically the idea of if stuff is going to reach the masses and go mainstream, it has to kind of have a use case that's mass, that, that works for everyone and not just for kind of us early adopter folks. Um, and we don't always know what's going to appeal uh, outside of our circle. Some stuff does. It's called like crossing the chasm, right? Mm -hmm. Some stuff doesn't cross the chasm. Some stuff does. A lot of the future is dependent on what they do next, though. So it's very hard to predict their performance or their execution mm -hmm. over time. If they keep executing, I think you know, live streaming could be a big thing. Next question um, is from Peter. Instead of seeing yourself five years from now, what advice would you give yourself five years ago no. for all those entrepreneurs I like out that. there? Um, five years. So what year are we talking about five years ago? 2010. 2010, yeah. Uh, 2000 feels like five years yeah. ago. I can't believe the 90s is like 20 <laughs> plus years ago. Because um, you founded the company 10 years ago? Well, also the Backstreet Boys are back, which is really confusing. <laughs> um, Throws off all frames of reference. Yeah, Mashable started 10 years ago, yeah, so we're so talking halfway through Mashable. Yeah. So I'm like 24, living in San Francisco, I think. Um, I think. Um, I think in that era, it's. I think. So what, what a lot of people ask you is if you started on that particular day, what would you have done? I think if I started around 2010, I would have had a YouTube channel and just been a video blogger or something like that. Um, but we were very kind of ingrained in text-based blogging and getting really good at that. So probably, you know, embrace the new mediums, try the new mediums, and think about the company as a broader thing than just what you are right now. You know, try and try and try out these new networks. Is there a mistake you made that you wish you hadn't? I don't think you ever regret trying new stuff. I think maybe not trying enough, uh, enough new stuff is kind of something that, that I could have done better. Um, people are very cautious about when new things come out. Like, let's see if it's going to be a thing first and then jump in. And I think it's better to just experiment and, and try what's new. So if anything, just like take a bit more risk. Next question is, do you think immediacy takes away from artistry, as in film or writing? Is the artistry of the meerkat um, less artistic because he doesn't get to edit it or anything? Does immediacy take away from artistry? So I think that creativity can work on different timescales. I think if you're writing a book, you should probably turn off Twitter. You can get a lot of apps that can do that. Um, <laughs> Because it can be very interruptive, and one of the challenges of social is it's putting people into very short cycles of like, uh, you know, what's next? What's next? I need the new thing, and constantly trying to like seek the next sugar rush. And but I also think that the best way to be creative or get good at stuff is to break it down in little bits and keep doing that thing again and again and again. Like if you want to make a movie, don't set out to make a movie. Just make a video every single day learn from your failures. You're never gonna like, you're never gonna like mentally create the perfect movie. Like you're just gonna sit and be like, okay, it's gonna be like this, and it's gonna work like that. Um, you just need to make stuff all the time. So one of the things that social media does contribute to creatively is to force you into like, okay, I need to update this thing. I need to, like if you're a comedian, you need to tweet a joke every day. You're gonna get really good at coming up with great jokes off the cuff. If you're like a photographer, Yes, Instagram might be a more limited tool than your DSLR and then going in and editing it and then putting it up on something fancy like Flickr or you know 500 pics or what people are using these days, but it gets you in the habit of doing it frequently and that's really the only way to get 
good at stuff. You'll have some kind of base level of talent and ability, but the vast majority of people who are dominant in creative industries have just done it so frequently that it's just a muscle that they're exercising. The Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours theory. Yeah, I don't know if it's exactly 10,000. Yeah, I think if you did hours. more than 10,000, you'd be even better than that yeah. person. It's like, I did 20,000, yeah. ha. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, um, I think it, it does make people try stuff and, and create more, and that's the only way to get better at creating stuff. Next question is, what's the future of traditional advertising agencies? The future of traditional You're working with agencies. brands directly now. Do you need the ad agencies to help them figure out what to do? So I think they're evolving. I think one of the things that media companies do now is they uh, create the content, they do a lot of the ideation on the ads, they create the ads, they distribute the content and the ads. I think smart media companies are figuring out their place in that ecosystem or smart advertising agencies. I think they will always exist in some capacity and many of them will evolve, right? So this programmatic has obviously come along and automated a lot of advertising, uh, but they can get really good at those tools. They can own those tools sometimes. Some of them are doing tech acquisitions and that kind of thing. Um, and there'll always be a place for creativity even as technology kind of becomes more dominant. So I think the smart ones will find their place, but they're definitely in transition, and, and if what they sell is creativity and ideas, and they get really good at that, and they get really good at understanding the tech, because nobody can keep up with this stuff anymore. So, you know, if ad agencies can be the friend to the brands that tells them, look, here's the platforms you need to focus on, here's the way you need to tell your stories, and here's a bunch of ideas, um, I think they'll be fine. But it's definitely a huge transition, and, and some of them will struggle for sure. Next question is, do you feel privacy concerns also contribute to people being more concise or smart about how they publish content? Um, being more concise I guess the question smart. is, how do you think privacy concerns are impacting the way we're broadcasting ourselves, whether it's through you know, tweets or mm -hmm. meerkats or whatever? Um, yeah, I think it's a really important issue. I think it's been a kind of a, a theme this year at South by Southwest. I think the reality is, is this intersects again with globalization. You have these systems that are online, they're accessible from anywhere, and it's not just the security of um, you know, your country, but internationally, you know, these things are all online. Uh, if you have a door that anyone can knock at in any country at any time, then uh, it's just all a lot more accessible. Um, so I think people should think about privacy as they're using these tools, and I think Companies that build them should integrate privacy from the start. Things like two-step authorization is really key. Uh, you know, you've seen a lot of companies add that late. There's just really simple things they can mm -hmm. do, and then all the way to securing their own servers, to having good policies around what do we give to the government, you know, or what, what can we, uh, how can we protect the user's data? So I think it's really key. I think anyone building tools on the internet should be really aware of their user privacy, and their policies around data storage and retention, and doing basic stuff that empowers the user to protect themselves, like two-step authorization. But what about all these new services? I mean, like Snapchat. I mean, there's also like Wicker, which are these yeah. new social sharing apps that are all about you know, allowing people to maintain secrecy or privacy or share to a much more limited group. I mean, is so, there so I a think backlash? part of it, so, so that stuff is definitely a reaction to something that's happening in the culture. And if you think about, why those things have been successful. You can't be successful by being the same as the stuff that exists. So to, to be successful in a Facebook world, you have to be not Facebook, right? Um, and Snapchat is definitely not Facebook. Uh, stuff goes away, it's more visual, it's more personal, it's messaging rather than pub production and publishing. Uh, and I think some of that is a reaction to this idea that stuff on the web lasts forever, especially in the teen demographic. They're aware now that they're going to be applying for jobs in a few years, that they want to not have stuff. I mean, no one would want their, their kind of their teen poetry online. You know what I mean? Like, we all do those things. We're learning what our identity is, and we're trying stuff out. And it's going to be embarrassing when we look back 10 years later or when we're trying to apply for a job. So I think it's kind of a reaction to that. It's kind of a reaction to permanence. So what are they calling it? Ephemerality. Yeah. Um, I think that's more about ephemerality. Maybe it is a bit about privacy, but 
you know, if you're sharing stuff on Snapchat because you think it can never be captured or shared or stored or anything, um, you're in for some surprises. Yeah. Um, when you produce hot content, how do you balance production time, quality, cost? When you produce hot content, yeah. So that's. Um, so we're talking about if you're in a rush to make your stuff, can you still make it good? If, you, if Velocity is telling you you've got to get something out there about the dress, some play on it. Yes, yeah, so for us, the measure is accuracy and truth, right? We don't want to rush to something. We still have that rule of, like, let's check our sources and make sure it's right, because putting out something that's not true is so damaging that it's hard to get back from it. Um, I think people's expectations or even definitions of what is quality are changing, right? You can do something completely different on Snapchat, and in fact, you want it to feel more human than maybe what you're putting out on Mashable.com or some of our own platforms. So there's definitely a spectrum. It's definitely like uh, choose the right format for the right platform. Um, but you can also evolve a story. You know, you can put out the breaking story of just the facts that you have, and then you can update and add and grow, but the, you have to be accurate in all you do. You can't update and go like, oh, sorry, that was completely wrong. Um, you need to be consistent with it. What's the biggest opportunity for AI and social media over the next three to five years? AI and social media. Um, well, right now, the biggest problem we have, and that's what Velocity is trying to address, is just big data. There's so much of it. Like, how do you make sense of all the information you're getting. How do we make sense of all the information we're getting from our community? Brands are trying to make sense of what do people like about our product? What don't they like? How do we change it? Um, and there's so much data that people can't go through it all. So I think the biggest opportunity for AI is to make sense of human language, to make sense of big data, to understand what do people want and when do they want it. And you're starting to see that in things like Google Now, where it's like trying to understand you know, what do you need right now? Maybe if you have this very limited watch screen, then you have this huge data stream of all the stuff that's going on. How do you give me the right update at the right time in the right place? That's really the opportunity for AI is to figure all that out. Great. Do another question. I think that's the tweets. I think, I think, that, I think we read all of Twitter. Have we, have we done all of Twitter? Yeah, we're at the we're end of it, delay. last page. We have time probably for one more question if the, the man behind the curtain wants to switch out the tweet. Otherwise, uh, there is no man behind the curtain. Yeah. <laughs> it's AI. It's AI. It's all a robot. Um, there we go. Oh. Last one, media, media and tech. tech. What's next? What How about that? Next? That's a big question. Big question. Big question for your last question. Um, what is the future? I think there's a couple things that are really exciting right now. Uh, beyond wearables and the idea that the device is getting smaller and smaller and you have to tell stories in new ways, I think virtual reality is kind of interesting, augmented reality. Is there a space for, for Mashable to be programming content for my Oculus Rift? Um, I think so. I think, um, I think it's, you know, we were trying, you know, someone came in and showed us like a documentary they'd made. Um, and it was really immersive. You're like in a refugee camp and you could look around and you were like inside the tents and you felt like you were there and you were that person. And I think it's a different storytelling medium, but I think there is definitely a place for it. It's probably quite far off, but I don't think, one of the problems is in order to create something with mass distribution, you need a lot of people to have that device and that's where phones are right now. It's not where wearables are or VR headsets are. Most people don't have one. So even if you make stuff for those platforms, most people can't consume it. But I think we will get there and I think we'll find new ways to tell stories there as well. And do you think that people want, I mean, want those headsets? I mean, we're gonna really see the next wave or the, the first real wave, the consumer headsets you know, start to be adopted over the next year, and you have Google Cardboard, which is a much lower cost mm -hmm. way of doing VR. I mean, how optimistic are you that this is the future of media and tech, as the question asked? So what I've learned with tech is every idea happens eventually, it's just did you get the timing right? So Google Glass, while people can kind of say, oh my goodness, like, that so didn't work, how could they have done that? Um, it will happen. The challenge with putting stuff on your face right now is the tech is too big. 
So, but I, the one thing I've learned is never bet in technology against stuff being too slow or too bulky, right? Because it's always going to get smaller, lighter, faster. So right now, these VR headsets are kind of silly looking, and you know, you're not going to go outside in that. And you probably kind of felt like the Google Glass was kind of silly looking. But as they get smaller, they get more integrated. You know, you put it in a contact lens. There's, there's a point that you hit where it suddenly becomes obvious. You know, mobile phone was that. It was this ridiculous big thing. And like, um, you know, you had like the, the Saved by the Bell phone where it's like, yeah, yeah. it's like a huge brick. <laughs> and like guys on yachts like standing up with like a huge brick. Um, car phones, you know, it was ridiculous, but it got small and light enough that everyone could use yeah. it. I don't know where that inflection point happens for virtual reality, for augmented reality, where the devices are small enough, light enough, fast enough, and actually fit into usual human behavior. It may be in a year, it may be in five years, it may not be for 10 years that the tech is really practical for that use, but I do know that eventually that Google Glass is like uh, a point on a graph towards that actually being a thing, but they're kind of too early right now. I'll be very curious to see if next year we're back here talking about content on watches and some sort of VR headset thing. So um, we're out of time, but Pete, thanks so much. Thanks and for having thanks, me. Thanks, audience, for your questions. Thank you. Great. Right. I've had good experiences uh, with collaborating with filmmakers where we just try and make something that we like, you know? And in a way, you, th you find out that you're not alone. But and I've had other experiences where you try and make things that everyone's going to like, and you, 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 know, you, you, feel, you feel foolish in the end to pretend to know what that is. Only you know what, what, what you like and want to see.